know that they've gone back to the Middle East, and it's clear now that they've also come to the United States. People like Ahmed Rassam, the man charged with attempting to bomb the United States over the millennium. He's a member of Algeria's armed Islamic group, but was trained by bin Laden. So were members of Pakistan's Harak ul Mujahideen group, which hijacked an Indian jetliner to Afghanistan in December 1999. On Friday, Pakistan's president informed the U.S. his country is prepared to take specific steps to help the U.S. wage its campaign against bin Laden. And in the Arab world, Powell has asked countries like Saudi Arabia to cut off the flow of money and resources to bin Laden. For Secretary Powell, who led Allied troops to victory in the Gulf War, this war against terrorists will be fought on an entirely different battlefield. And so you have to design a campaign plan that goes after that kind of enemy. And it isn't always blunt force military, although that is certainly an option. But diplomatic sources say whatever option the U.S. chooses to take, it will need the support of Islamic countries. Such support would send a strong message to bin Laden and his Islamic extremist supporters around the world. They have nowhere to hide. Andrea Koppel, CNN, at the State Department. Well, the U.S. request for support from Pakistan has left that country's president caught in the middle. Tom Mintir is in Islamabad and tells us that if Pakistan doesn't cooperate, it runs the risk of angering the Western world. But if it does help, it's going to face problems at home. Inside the mosques of the Pakistani city of Islamabad on this Friday day of prayer. Special prayers were said for the Americans killed by the terrorist attacks on the United States. A few miles away at the president's house, the government of Pakistan was also looking for guidance. The U.S. has presented not only a new ambassador to Pakistan, but at the same time a wish list if military action is launched against Afghanistan. Senior U.S. administration officials tell CNN that Pakistani leaders were asked to close the border with Afghanistan, stop buying fuel for the Taliban, and provide intelligence on Osama bin Laden. At this meeting of Pakistan's top military leaders, the only item on the agenda was how to assist the United States. The decision to help America goes against long-standing ties to the Taliban and assistance by some in the Pakistani military to bin Laden's cause. The help for and the United States could carry political risk at home. Imagine the consequences of it could be disastrous for Pakistan. And if there are American interests in Pakistan in the long run, then those interests will also suffer. Many in Pakistan have supported Osama bin Laden's efforts in the past. Now some political analysts are saying the Taliban needs to oust bin Laden before it's too late. Unless the, uh, the Taliban are willing to be bombed back to the Stone Age and cease to exist as an entity, I think, you know, sort of it is in the larger interest to get rid of Osama bin Laden, who has become a strategic liability for them. The United States has made it clear to Pakistan that it is either with America or against America. Publicly, it has announced support, but what is certainly not clear at this point is how extensive that support will be. Tom Intir, CNN, Islamabad, Pakistan. Well, the leader of Afghanistan's ruling Taliban addressed his country about possible attacks in a national radio address. The Taliban's supreme leader, Mullah Mohammed Omar, told citizens not to be afraid, but to prepare for a holy war. He said the attack would not be because of suspected terrorist Osama bin Laden, but called it a demonization of Islam. The Taliban have said that bin Laden could not have been involved in these attacks. Meanwhile, many residents and international aid workers have already fled the capital city of Kabul. Jim. If you're just joining our coverage of America's new war, we want to bring you up to date on the latest developments now. Against the backdrop of billowing smoke, rescuers are once again digging through the pile of destruction in New York City. It has been nearly four days since the attacks, and rescue operations have been ongoing ever since. No survivors were found in the last two days. Rescuers say they are still hopeful. Meantime, search crews in Pennsylvania recovered the voice data recorder from the hijacked United Airlines flight. Authorities are hoping it will reveal details about the plane's crash on Tuesday. Voice recorders on both planes that struck the World Trade Center are still missing. Now, authorities have made their first arrest in direct connection to the attacks. The Justice Department says the man is a material witness in the case. He was one of the people who was detained Thursday at JFK International Airport in New York. Thus far in the investigation, 
35 search warrants and hundreds of subpoenas have already been issued. You know, we saw those moving pictures earlier from the national, uh, the, the prayer uh, ceremony at the National Cathedral in Washington, a candlelight vigil going on on the west coast of this country right now. But, you know, many countries around the world join the American people in a day of mourning. And for more on this, let's join Jane Dutton in London. Jane? Thanks, Colleen. And indeed, there were vigils around the world Friday. Canada offered its prayers to the victims and its support to all Americans. Prime Minister Jean Chrétien said his country's friendship with the United States has no limit. We're here today to honor the memory of those who lost their lives on Tuesday for the national anthems. Three minutes of silence in memory of those who died. Britain and the rest of Europe came to a standstill in the middle of the day. Millions stood in silence, united in their support and sympathy for America. In Germany, thousands gathered for a ceremony of remembrance. Afterwards, there was a march for peace in the streets of Berlin. And in Iran, an unprecedented show of sympathy, the national soccer team and 60,000 spectators observed a minute of silence at the Tehran soccer stadium before a World Cup qualifying game. Iran has strongly condemned the attacks against the U.S., after two decades of enmity between the two countries, that's a gesture Washington is welcoming. The mood was also somber at NATO's headquarters in Brussels. There, too, it was a day of mourning, but also of hard reflection. The alliance's position is clear. The attacks were an assault against all of its members, but some may not be willing to join the U.S. on the battlefield. Dynamira reports. A time for respect and remembrance. The 19 ambassadors to NATO, shoulder to shoulder, observing three minutes of silence at midday on Friday, along with millions of other Europeans. They stand in readiness following Wednesday's affirmation of Article 5 of the Washington Treaty, the first time a commitment has been given to a collective defense against an attack on an alliance member. Quite what that commitment will involve is less clear. Some alliance members, like Britain, have promised strong support for any NATO effort. Even Norway, reported to be less enthusiastic, says its commitment is firm. Our resources are more limited, of course, than the United States resources, but we will certainly put military resources at, at the disposal of any operation that the alliance uh, would decide. Uh, there should be no doubt about that. Special forces or whatever we could bring to bear on the situation. The British and the French could also provide elite troops to any operation if required. But support from others, like the Netherlands, appears more muted. We will be with you, mentally, morally, and, and possibly also in concrete terms. But what it will be at that stage, um, I can't answer today. Former NATO chief Billy Klaus believes some members of the NATO alliance would be unwilling to participate in direct military action, particularly if that involved attacks on countries that are shown to have harbored or supported the terrorists responsible for Tuesday's acts of terror. It depends what countries and what will be what could be the, the consequences of, of the, the military actions against uh, those countries. Are we speaking about uh, countries controlling nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, yes or no? It's a, big, it's a big difference, you know. Until a terrorist target is identified, NATO allies are understood to be providing military intelligence to assist the United States in their investigation. As the 19 national flags of the NATO alliance fly at half-staff, the time for action could be approaching. The United States has yet to make specific demands for NATO assistance, but that is expected here in the coming days and weeks. Diana Muriel, CNN, at NATO headquarters in Brussels. That's it from me, Jane Dutton in London. For now, back to you, Jim, in Atlanta. All right, Jane, thanks for that. Well, Tuesday's attacks have led three of America's largest companies to issue profit warnings now. General Electric says its insurance business expects claims of some $600 million as a result of the attacks. And then another insurance company, MetLife, says it stands to lose between $250 and $300 million. However, it says it will do everything possible to pay claims promptly. And carmaker Ford reports that it will cut third quarter production by some 110,000 vehicles. That is because transport problems have held up the delivery of needed components. 
Well, the New York Stock Exchange is scheduled to reopen Monday after four days without the familiar opening bell and these days the ups and downs of the Dow Jones and the Nasdaq. Greg Clarkin reports on what's being done to ensure an orderly resumption of trading. They washed away the dirt and the grime, hoping to cleanse Wall Street of the remnants of the attacks on the World Trade Center. But inside the New York Stock Exchange, the challenges to restoring trading ran deeper. There are monumental telecommunications obstacles, including making sure electric and phone service will be intact. And then there is the main issue, making sure the sophisticated network that handles the trades for the NYSE can be processed. The challenge is recreating the network, the interconnected infrastructure that brings 85 million investors individually and another 10,000 institutions from all over the world. The New York Board of Trade was located in the World Trade Center complex and will have a new facility come Monday. Well, the major issue is we have to make sure that all of our clearing members are able to re receive the trades and to clear them. Uh, it's one thing to trade, but if you don't match them and clear them, you've got a, a serious problem. All of the trading exchanges will be undergoing extensive testing this weekend to spot potential problems. I mean, we've got to make sure we have adequate power, we have adequate access to downtown, uh, and that we have the uh, telecommunications capability necessary to carry uh, all of this. The NYSE and other exchanges will be working through the weekend, testing and retesting computer and telecommunication systems, all in an effort to make sure Monday morning's trading goes smoothly. Greg Clark in CNN Financial News, New York. Now, the international financial community is waiting with some trepidation, we should say, for Monday's opening bell on Wall Street. Robert Miller is an associate editor at Sunday Business. That's a British financial magazine. He's joining us now from London. Thanks so much. And I want to begin just by asking you the bottom line. Are we worried about the technical end of it or the psychological end? It's a bit of both, I think, Jim. Good morning from here. I think that, first of all, it would be... Uh, wrong to assume that it will be a f anything like a full trading session. Many of the people with their disaster recovery, as we've heard earlier on your reports, uh, it's, it's operating perhaps on a, on a quarter strength. So there will be some nervousness. There's definitely, will the system hold up? And certainly the regulators from this end, uh, the equivalent of your SEC, the Financial Services Authority and the Bank of England are standing by if necessary to help out. Uh, the psychological, of course, no one can tell except that it will be absolutely huge and in many ways it's perhaps a symbolic opening rather than expecting huge volumes from this end anyway. All right when we look at the uh, the situation that's facing the market here uh, we have to also look at the way that uh, people expect things to go. Now we watch the dips in Europe and Asia after this disaster. The U.S. markets have been closed and they actually do provide quite a bit of leadership don't they? I think perhaps if, if anything has been borne home in market terms since Tuesday's awful events, it is that the world markets certainly do still take their lead from Wall Street. We all need Wall Street, if you like, as a totem pole uh, as to what's happening. Obviously, individual markets will react to individual events, but clearly Wall Street, or perhaps what I'm talking collectively about all the different exchanges in America, are very much the leaders. We do take our lead. And, and obviously, as you say, they've been closed. Does this terrorist attack risking pushing the U.S. economy into a full-fledged recession and, and thereby risking the, the wider global economy? I think the likelihood, it was there before. I think American consumers realized that uh, before the, perhaps the Michigan Confidence Index, which showed an eight-time low in, in, in consumer confidence. And what we perhaps forget in all this is that the American economy, large though it is, is roughly two-thirds consumer spending. The consumers, uh, certainly from our point of view over here and in other world markets, consumers have been the spenders of last resort. We're now asking them to, to sort of gird up their loins after this to go at it again. I, I, I think that's possibly a very tall order and I would suspect anyway for perhaps this quarter and the next quarter that the American economy will skate into recession. How it comes out of that and, and how quickly I think will depend uh, perhaps on the uh, earnings uh, season coming up. The companies traditionally in America, as you know, look at their uh, forward investment plans around about this time of year. Just They've been down recently in the last couple of years. 
just because of the politics involved, the prestige involved, do you think that the federal government, the Fed, is going to act more quickly, perhaps cutting rates by a full 